This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Policy uncertainty. The Senate delays its vote on the health care bill and stocks immediately slide. Record fine. Google is hit with a multi-billion dollar antitrust bill. Could there be more to come? Hitting the road. Gas prices are supposed to rise this time of year, but that's not happening. And there's reason to believe they could go even lower. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Tuesday, June 27th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Sue Herrera. Tyler Matheson is on assignment tonight. A record find for Google. We'll have more on that in just a moment. But we begin tonight with the market and the swift reaction on Wall Street to news that the vote on the Senate health care bill will be delayed. Leadership had been pushing for a vote ahead of the July 4th recess, but now that's going to take place after that. The president called Senate Republicans to the White House for a meeting this afternoon as Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said extra time is needed to get more support for the bill. We're going to continue the discussions within our conference on the differences that we have that we're continuing to try to litigate. Uh, consequently, we will not be on the bill this week, but we're still working toward getting uh, at least 50 people in a comfortable place. Stocks dipped midday and stayed lower. The Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 98 points to 21,310. The Nasdaq was off 100, and the S&P 500 fell 19. The European Union has slapped Alphabet's Google unit with a record fine, more than $2.5 billion. The regulators allege that Google is taking advantage of its dominance in online searches to direct customers to its online shopping business. Shares of Alphabet fell more than 2 percent. And if Google doesn't stop the practice within 90 days, it will have to pay even more. Google's don't be evil culture is far from its practice, according to the European Union, which announced its biggest ever fine, more than $2.7 billion, a possible warning shot to the world's biggest tech companies. The EU says Google abused its position as the dominant search engine, giving its own shopping service top billing in search results, while relegating competitors to far less valuable real estate down the list. They've used this dominance to promote themselves and to demote rivals. Google, considering an appeal, says competitor sites are not harmed by its practices, claiming shoppers, quote, prefer links that take them directly to the products they want, not to websites where they have to repeat their searches, end quote. The EU is basing its case on research using more than one and a half billion searches. It says Google began to give an advantage to its own service back in 2008. And since then, traffic on Google Shopping spiked 45 times higher in the UK, 35 times higher in Germany, and rose by factors of 29 in the Netherlands and 19 in France. The EU blames Google for corresponding traffic drops to certain sites, down as much as 92 percent in Germany, 85 percent in the UK, and 80 percent in France. Alphabet's EU problem won't end with the fine. Separate EU investigations are continuing into alleged abuses involving Google's Android operating system, its ad sales business, the way it handles local travel and map searches, and how it uses copyrighted material. The EU has battled the U.S. high-tech complex before. Its previous record fine was handed down to Intel in 2009, almost $1.5 billion, and a series of Microsoft fines totaling more than $2 billion began in 2004. Today's fine means dominant tech players like Amazon, Facebook, and others will be watching to see whether Alphabet fights the fine and what changes the EU can force on Google. So let's turn now to Timothy Lesko to talk more about how Google's record fine might affect other big U.S. tech companies that do business in the European Union. He is the portfolio manager at Granite Investment Advisors. Welcome. It's nice to have you here. No, thanks for having me. So, Tim, this is being called by some a precedent-setting event and fine by the EU. Would you agree with that? Oh, I would argue that perhaps the precedent for the EU fining U.S.-based technology companies for their sales practices may have started with Microsoft. But the technology we're talking about now is far different from the bundling of Internet Explorer a few decades ago. So maybe it's precedent-setting in a world of big data, 
but there are, there are a lot of interesting side currents going on in the use of big data uh, and search. Is it that the EU opposes the bundle, or is it that the EU is looking down the line um, at some of the now voice-activated technologies that, that also might put some of their companies at a disadvantage? Well, I, th I think you, you hit the nail on the head. And when you search Google, it's not a surprise to many, at least here, that when you search you know, certain sites, you're probably going to get their stuff first. Uh, the European Union has long had a, a, a very hot button for anti-competitive behaviors, uh, where we here in the States uh, you know, keep an eye on anti-competitive behaviors. But you're dealing in a marketplace that has continued to see drill prices down rather than up. So rather than monopolistic tendency, it's more anti-competitive tendencies. Um, and I think the EU will continue to take a hard look at all companies. I don't think they're focusing on the U.S. particularly. We just happen to be one of the better exporters of technology. Now, for Alphabet, this is not, even though it's, it's a, a big monetary amount, for Alphabet, it is not when you compare what they are actually worth. But what about for other companies? What about for a Microsoft, for an Apple, and other tech companies that do business or want to do business in the EU? Well, I, I think, well, Apple just went through its own slate with some tax issues in the mm -hmm. European Union. Uh, I think you have a situation where all of these companies are very, very large. So a $2.7 billion fine for Google, whereas the headline, it looks huge. Uh, the more difficulty would come for them is what kind of business practices this forces them to change. In Google, essentially, the, the, the product is the consumer, not what Google is really selling. So I think what they're really trying to head off in the European Union is Google using your data, whether it be your search data, your personal data, or any data that you enter into your device, whether it be a computer or a mobile device, isn't used for other purposes. Uh, and I think that's always been a dividing line between companies like like Google and Apple, where Apple actually charges you more for the device and does not sell your data. Tim, thank you so much. Timothy Lesko with thank Granite Investment me. Advisors. The president of the European Central Bank makes some upbeat comments on that region's economy, saying the European economy is strengthening and that inflation is eventually coming. All the signs now point to a strengthening and broadening recovery in the euro area. Deflationary forces have been replaced by reflationary ones. While there are still factors that are weighing on the path of inflation, at present they are mainly temporary factors that typically the central bank can look through. And it was that word reflation that got the attention of the bond market both in Europe and here in the U.S., causing yields to move higher. The International Monetary Fund is cutting its outlook for the U.S. economy. The fund cited broad uncertainty on fiscal policy, including the president's plan to cut taxes and increase infrastructure spending. The IMF also said the downgrade was due to an aging American population, low productivity growth, and a labor market already back at full employment. Consumers grew more confident in June. According to the conference board, Americans expect the economy to continue expanding in the coming months, but they do not foresee the pace of growth accelerating. And in theory, the better people feel, the more they spend. And consumer spending makes up a large chunk of economic activity. Well, the red-hot housing market may be starting to cool a bit. A new report today shows that prices are still climbing compared to a year ago, but the pace of the gains appears to be slowing a bit. And that has many asking if the run-up in prices is sustainable. Diana Olick takes a look. The latest gains on the S&P Case-Shiller Home Price Index hit a new high, but were slightly smaller than expected. The national index rose 5.5% year-over-year in April, down from 5.6% in March. But here comes the perspective. These are prices that were recorded on closed sales in April, so sales that were negotiated in February and March. Since then, the supply situation has only gotten worse due to higher demand in the spring market. Seattle, Portland and Dallas reported the highest annual gains in prices and seven cities had bigger annual increases in April than in March. S&P's David Blitzer raised the question in his release of a potential bubble or crash, but then he knocked it down, saying that demand and employment still support the prices for now. We're also not seeing the kind of housing boom at all that we saw in the last decade. 
Professor Robert Schiller told me he does not believe home prices are too high. In fact, he shows that adjusted for inflation, they're actually still below the peak of the last housing boom. Still, again, these prices are a bit old. A new demand index from Redfin reached another record high in May, with 9% more buyers requesting home tours and an even bigger jump in the number of buyers writing offers. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. Coming up, vicious virus. Companies worldwide were victims of a new cyber attack, and it seemed to spread quickly. A global cyber attack today hit companies and governments across the globe. Computer systems in Europe, Russia, and the U.S. were all struck, leaving questions and chaos in its wake. Eamon Javers has the details. The Trump administration offering support today as this sweeping global cyber attack continues to affect companies around the world. Take a look at a list here of all of the different countries where companies and entities have reported that they've been victims of this cyber attack, including in the Ukraine, a number of different companies and government entities in Russia as well, a state-owned oil firm, Rosneft, in the UK, WPP Advertising and DLA Piper, the law firm, uh, said that they were hit in the United States, Merck, the pharmaceutical company in France, and in Denmark. Mark also companies reporting that they had been hit by this cyber attack. Here's what the Department of Homeland Security had to say. They said they're monitoring reports of cyber attacks affecting multiple global entities and coordinating with our international and domestic cyber partners. We stand ready to support any requests for assistance. Upon request, DHS routinely provides technical analysis and support. Information shared with DHS as part of these efforts, including whether a request has been made, is confidential. So the U.S. government offering its support here, but one of the problems that tends to come up in a cyber attack like this, in the case of ransomware, where the hackers actually lock down the data or steal the data and demand payment in order to get it back, is that companies often do end up paying. That's why ransomware continues to exist. If companies didn't pay, there would be no ransomware. Clearly, someone is paying, and that's often because companies view that data as so important uh, to their ongoing operations and so expensive to replicate that they think that paying the hackers is a better deal than losing the data. That goes against advice from cybersecurity professionals, but of course those professionals aren't the same people who are tasked with running businesses. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eamon Javers at the White House. So how damaging is this latest cyber attack to U.S. corporations and can they protect themselves from future attacks? Leo Tadio is the chief security officer at the data center firm Sixera Technologies and a former FBI agent in charge of the cybersecurity operations division in New York. Welcome, Leo. Nice to have you here. Thank you, Sue. Thanks for having me. What is your perspective on this latest attack? It certainly was wide ranging. It was global. And I found it interesting that that it wasn't one specific type of company or area of, of a company. It was, it was all sorts of different corporations. Right, so the reports on the number of victims, the different types of victims, and the de different uh, geographic uh, locations for the victims point out uh, that the perpetrators of this attack may not have understood uh, the exact consequences of unleashing uh, a cyber tool that was uh, reportedly developed for offensive purposes. Uh, so what we have is the unintended consequences, it appears, mm -hmm. of, uh, of the uh, perpetrators in this case uh, releasing something that they didn't fully understand. How prepared do you think most, and I know this is a tough question to answer, most U.S. corporations are uh, for this type of an attack? I think most large U.S. corporations have increased their capability to defend against this attack. The problem that large corporations have is they don't have absolute control over every part of their infrastructure. So uh, despite uh, very robust attempts to protect their infrastructure and uh, large spending on this problem, there remain pockets of weakness. And ferreting out those pockets of weakness uh, to identify where the uh, security controls need to go is a significant challenge for U.S. corporations. And I see you made a point in my notes here that we also have seen mergers where companies buy other companies and you inherit the company that you bought 
and their security methodology. Right. So certainly uh, the acquisition of a, of a company or a set of infrastructure from a company introduces new risk. Uh, connecting to something that's not fully understood uh, certainly presents a challenge. And this goes for uh, our partners as well. So we have third-party vendors that we connect to and that we allow to connect to our networks. And we basically inherit a large part of the risk that they are facing as well. What about Eamon Jabber's point at the end of his report about paying ransom? Is it a good idea to do it? He made the point that gathering this data or replicating the data that these large corporations have is incredibly expensive, if they can even do it quickly enough. So they pay the ransom. Good idea or not? Well, a company uh, has to make that decision based on the best interests of uh, operations. Um, the general advice from the FBI and other law enforcement agencies is not to pay ransom uh, because it funds uh, further activity and further research and development. It allows uh, these uh, criminals to perfect the tools that they deploy against us. So the general advice is not to pay, but each business has to face that decision on its own. And certainly if it's a decision between operating and not operating, right. uh, a business will make the practical choice to pay the ransom. Leo, thank you so much. Leo Thank Tadio you, with Sigterra. Thank you. Darden Restaurants hikes its dividend, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The parent of Olive Garden said that it would raise its quarterly dividend 12.5% to 63 cents a share. This follows the company reporting better than expected revenue, which was helped by stronger same store sales. Profit also topped expectations, and the shares rose nearly 3% to 92.69. Sprint is reportedly in talks with cable providers Charter Communications and Comcast regarding a potential wireless partnership. According to reports, Sprint has put the brakes on merger talks with rival T-Mobile as it continues a two-month-long period of negotiations with Charter and Comcast. Sprint shares were up 2 percent to $8.18. Shares of Charter Communications were lower, as were Comcast, which is the parent company of CNBC, which produces this program. Merck said its cholesterol drug during a trial significantly lowered the risk of heart attack and death in patients who have a high risk of cardiovascular issues. Despite the upbeat results, though, Merck said it's still considering whether it will file for regulatory approval. It first plans to review the data with experts. Shares fell just a fraction to 65.54. And KB Homes reported a rise in sales that topped estimates. That home builder cited higher average selling prices and a rise in deliveries. Profit was also a beat, and the company said it was raising its financial targets for the full year. Shares initially rose in after-hours trading and also ended the regular session just slightly higher to $22.82. Are you getting away this weekend? Well, if you are, and it's by car, you could be in for a treat when you go to fill up. According to Gas Buddy, for the first time in 17 years, gas prices will be lower on the 4th of July than they were on New Year's Day. And that's a dramatic turnaround from previous estimates. Da Jackie DeAngelis explains why and if prices might go even lower. For drivers, this could be a summer to remember. Gas prices are at record low just in time for the holiday weekend, considered the peak of the summer driving season. The national average for a gallon of regular gas is $2.25. That's down 12 cents from a month ago and six cents lower than it was at this time last year. The decline at the pump coming after crude shed 20% of its price in the first half of the year. Since the beginning of the year, crude oil prices are down just over 17%. Gasoline price is down just less than 12 percent. What that means is that refiners have been fattening up their margins, but we know that gasoline is down quite a bit, and it's all to do with crude oil. And experts say gas prices could drop even further. Seasonally, this is when demand is strong, and the autumn is when we see it fall off. If prices do fall from a ready to press levels, it could mean that crude could see the 30s, even the 20s again. This will be the first time that gasoline prices on the 4th of July are lower than they were on New Year's since 2001. And so we know that gasoline prices are low. If you're waiting for them to go much lower before you fill the tank, I'm not certain I'd do that. And while consumers can take advantage of cheaper gas, investors may also have less to worry about. Some analysts say that lower crude prices might not be a drag on the broader stock market as they have in the past. That's because big oil is doing better at managing this environment, and companies that use oil will do better as they save on a key cost. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jackie DeAngelis.
Coming up, one state, two labor issues. We'll take a trip to California where tensions are rising. Just one day after an activist investor took a stake in Nestle, the company announced plans to buy back as much as $20 billion worth of shares over three years. Nestle will also focus its investment spending on its high-growth food and beverage businesses, like coffee and bottled water. Nestle says the plan is the result of a review that began earlier this year. It did not mention the activist stake in its statement. Well, the writer's strike didn't happen, but there is a chance an actor's strike might. The deadline is Friday, and Hollywood could be bracing for a major work stoppage. Julia Borston has more from Los Angeles. Action! Hollywood studios are on alert after they narrowly avoided a writer's strike that could have crippled the entertainment industry. Now, the Screen Actors Guild is inching closer to a potential strike after their contract with the media companies expires Friday night. The Guild, SAG-AFTRA, is asking its 160,000 members working in television and film to authorize a strike as it seeks to increase payments as the rise of shows on Netflix and Amazon results in shorter seasons and lower long-term compensation. Actors, writers, directors get what are called residuals, which are basically royalties when shows are rerun or reused. And one of the concerns that the actors have is, are those residuals, those royalties, going to be sufficient in an era of Netflix? The formulas are different than what they were used to with the network television. The Guild writing in a letter to members, quote, we have presented reasonable proposals to address the critical concerns facing our members and that are integral to making a living in this industry. We reached out to the AMPTP, the Alliance of Studios, which said it's an immediate blackout as negotiations continue. And negotiations could continue past the deadline as both sides look to avoid a strike that could see actors walk off movie and TV sets. Ten. A work stoppage would have an immediate effect on the media companies such as CBS, Fox, Disney and Comcast. Entertainment attorney Jonathan Handel estimates a strike could cost the industry and the local economy around $200 million a week. In terms of the uh, effect on the fall season, the broadcast season, that's the big question. If a strike started, it would probably be around July 15th. And you can't go too many weeks after that without starting to delay the fall season. While streaming services would also see their show production disrupted by a strike, their deep libraries of older content could find new viewers if television shows are delayed on the networks. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. That potential strike isn't California's only labor issue. The Supreme Court decision to allow President Trump's travel ban to take limited effect throws yet another ingredient into the debate about immigration and its impact on business and jobs. Also in the mix, the administration's renewed focus on visas for tech workers. And nowhere are they feeling it more than in Silicon Valley, where Scott Cohn is reporting for us tonight. For Dilawar Saeed, this is personal. I um, spent almost a decade, uh, if not more, in the early part of my career going through various immigration uh, statuses. And I saw firsthand the challenges, uh, the pitfalls of our broken system. Today, Saeed is a citizen and president of Freshworks, a software company with 1,000 employees and 100,000 customers worldwide. And he says he couldn't do it without foreign workers. It comes in the way of your ability to um, fill critical roles, for you to be able to grow the business, for you to launch new products. Silicon Valley and California in general is one of the biggest users of so-called H-1B visas, a program to let companies hire specialized workers from overseas. Also big users, New Jersey, Massachusetts and Delaware. At a time when as many as half of employers nationwide and here in Silicon Valley are having trouble filling skilled positions, companies are aggressively using foreign workers to fill the gap. But the Trump administration has other ideas. From this day forward, it's going to be only America 
first. The entire H-1B program is under review, also apparently out, a visa program tailored for startups. For the first time in years, the volume of H-1B applications is down. At the biggest incubator firm in Silicon Valley, Y Combinator, they're worried. That's a very delicate ecosystem that creates all of these big companies that employs all of these people in America. Um, you start changing and negatively impacting immigration laws, it's very easy to change the environment here and destroy it. But the former congressman who wrote the H-1B visa law says companies are misusing the system, hiring cheaper workers at the expense of Americans. Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of double talk on this. Everybody wants to see our economy grow. Uh, part of having the economy grow is getting the immigration system right without competing unfairly with Americans. Even in Silicon Valley, most agree the system needs fixing because one of the things these companies need most is brain power. If they can't get it here, they'll get it somewhere else. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Scott Cohn in San Jose, California. And finally tonight, a birthday celebration. The world's very first ATM, located at a Barclays branch in England, turned 50 today. Since its inception in 1967, the machine's popularity has grown exponentially, becoming an indispensable part of daily life. There are now an estimated 3 million ATMs located around the world. Can't believe it was 50. That is Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. Have a great evening, and we will see you right back here tomorrow.